Across different times and places, three very unusual disappearances emerged. Each of them left behind a trail of unanswered questions and a string of bewildered investigators. Let's recount their stories and present the facts as they are known. To do so, let's begin with the disappearance of 29-year-old Rory Johnson Hatfield, who vanished from York in the United Kingdom on the 20th of November, 2015. York was a city that Rory knew well, and on the previous night, the 19th, he was on a night out with his friends. They'd been enjoying an evening catching up at the opening of Thor's Tippy Bar, and were there to watch the Christmas lights being switched on before calling it a night. Rory and the friends were all staying at the York Central Travel Lodge on Piccadilly. This hotel would be the last time he would ever be seen again, or rather, as he was leaving it. It seems that Rory wasn't quite finished on this night out, as he arrived back at the lodge at 12am with two of the men that were not a part of the friend group. He was then last seen by one of his friends at 12.15am, leaving the lodge with one of the guests that he'd returned with. Rory and this guest had become acquainted after having met this guest and the guest's father at the Post and Gate Weatherspoon pub at roughly 11.30pm on the 19th. Or rather, I suppose, just an hour or so before he vanished. This Weatherspoons was either a part of the same building as the hotel, or it was the building right across the road. In any case, Rory was seen leaving it at around 12.30am, so 15 minutes after leaving the hotel. CCTV then picked him up again on Tower Street 9 minutes later. 8 minutes after that, he was spotted again in the City Mills area, which was the very last time he was ever picked up on camera. Afterwards, he simply vanished without a trace. It wasn't realised that Rory had gone missing right away. His friends did know that he hadn't made it back to his hotel room, but presumed that he might have met someone and could have just been staying over somewhere. It was when he failed to turn up for work on the evening of the 20th that people realised that something was wrong. When law enforcement began their investigation, initially they believed that Rory must have gotten into some difficulty while walking near the River Ouse, around the Skeldergate Bridge area because this was roughly the point at which he was spotted on CCTV after 12.30am. An extensive search was undertaken by the authorities and professional search and rescue personnel, but these searches around York itself, as well as the underwater searches, failed to reveal even a hint of Rory. It's not clear what, but it seems that something bad happened to Rory between Tower Street and City Mills. Now, nothing is sounding too unusual at the moment, so let's get bizarre. The CCTV footage in question, and members of the public who'd seen him, didn't just spot him. The footage and people's testimonies were somewhat peculiar. In these testimonies, it was stated by the people who saw him that he was running and it seemed like he was displaying the behaviours of a person being chased. The problem? There was absolutely no one chasing Rory, either on foot or by the use of a vehicle which was confirmed by the CCTV footage also. Shortly after displaying this unusual behaviour, and once he came to a halt from running away, he was then last seen on the balcony of a care home, meaning that he climbed up there. Just what exactly scared him so much that he was actively running away and climbing up the side of a building to get away from? What was happening and what did he think was happening? You can only presume that for one reason or another, something must have scared him. So did he believe that there was a source of danger nearby or chasing after him? This probably doesn't need to be said, but all concerned and his family stated that all of this was completely out of character. Although the eight year anniversary of Rory's disappearance is looming, North Yorkshire police has never found any definitive leads pointing to what happened. Accounts from friends suggested that he hadn't had too much to drink and only had two pints. His father, Doug Hatfield, says CCTV of his son on Skeldergate showed him seemingly jogging before he managed to get into City Mills, suggesting he was running away from something. Doug said Rory was last seen jogging down Skeldergate. Then he scaled a six foot gate to get onto the balcony and was seen by a resident at the care home. We have to wonder why he was doing this, he must have been chased. 
Doug added, unless there is proof of foul play, law enforcement are very lax about the investigation of missing people. Rory got no publicity outside of Yorkshire. We've never had any national coverage. So, as explained by his friends, Rory hadn't had too much to drink, and based on everything that has been reported, I don't believe that there were any other kinds of substances involved either, at least nothing that is known. Could something have been put into his drink that he didn't know about which caused him to behave that way? That's speculation of course, and there's no actual evidence of that. I must admit, for the most part, I find myself in agreement with Doug about Rory believing there may have been a threat posed to him somehow. The problem is that as said, CCTV nor anyone present actually saw anyone chasing or coming after him. So at the very least, Rory may have believed that he was in danger. It isn't really clear what was going on to cause this, but this kind of unusual behaviour, especially if you've been watching the channel recently, has come up a few times now, despite there seemingly being no perceived threat present at all. In the previous video, I covered the disappearance of Suvik Paul, who also scaled a fence with some suggesting that he may have been trying to get away from someone. In the video prior, David Plunkett began screaming out of nowhere during a phone call. His parents were on the phone with him at the time and called it an unearthly howl and stated that they had no one else present and no sort of commotion happening. I'll leave a link to both videos in the description below if you want to open a new tab. So, what caused Rory to begin running? If there was no CCTV or visual evidence by passers-by of Rory being chased either on foot or by car, what happened that made him experience fear in that moment? I say fear because as said, the people who saw him, they described the scene as someone appearing to be chased, but also no one seemingly doing the chasing. I've just had to come back and edit this in afterwards. But interestingly, the guest that Rory was with didn't even realise that he'd left. He believed that Rory had just gone to the toilet. Did something happen inside the toilets then? Did he see something he wasn't supposed to? I've no idea, but that fact certainly needed to be included here. Continuing on. Since that night, Rory has never been found. On the 21st, the day after he vanished, police searched the river around the spot where he was last seen. A second search involving kayaks and cadaver dogs searched a six mile stretch of the river. Police made multiple extensive searches of that river during the time of his disappearance. The search dogs never picked up a scent to indicate where he might have gone from the balcony. When these searches failed, a further search was undertaken by Rory's family alongside the help of the York Rescue Boat Service and the International Rescue Service which also didn't uncover anything. The family searched the riverbanks themselves and drones were put up into the air which flew along 56 miles of the river on both banks which also found nothing. A renowned search and rescue team from Bolton wanted to have a go and they brought in more search dogs and had them travel along the whole length of the river over the duration of their search, which was also not successful. Sonar scans were also used in the water on multiple occasions during the searches, but nothing was working. Just to clarify here, according to the locals, the bodies of the majority of people who enter the water are usually found, but it wasn't happening here. Doug didn't even believe that Rory had actually entered the water. On the 16th of November 2017, he said this, We've always maintained that Rory hasn't gone in the river. The police finished all of the searches just recently. That's two years down the road and there's been nothing found whatsoever. We need to move on from the river. The problem is, there's no real evidence of anything. After he scaled that gate and got up to the balcony, there's no evidence of foul play after that point, nor is there any evidence that he went into the water. Law enforcement just presumed that he had, but in reality, the whole time after he was sighted on the balcony is just one big question mark. It's like he was just plucked from the face of the earth and vanished. While researching this case, I came across a number of comments sharing a similar idea that gained traction, but doesn't really make too much sense. That being the notion of, perhaps he wasn't running out of fear, but instead because he needed the toilet. The idea being put forward here is that he ran to the river to take a leak, overbalanced and fell in. 
This does actually happen on occasion, but the problem here though, is that there were toilets inside the Weatherspoons and the hotel, which was far closer than the river. So I don't believe he was running near the hotel area, bypassing the toilets there to use the river a quarter of a mile away across a bridge. And in that scenario, why would he also scale a gate and climb up onto a balcony? It seems to me, almost certainly, that he was running for another reason that has never been and likely never will be understood now. With that, I've exhausted all of the information I could find about Rory, so let's now visit the United States of America. The next disappearance we're going to discuss took place in 1995, but this story actually begins in 1987, kind of. This incident takes us to the state of Washington and the city of Bellingham specifically. In 1987, a body was found in a chimney at the wastewater pulp mill facility at Georgia Pacific West Lagoon. This came about as employees were looking for a water leak, but instead found charred remains at the bottom of a chimney. The man's body was never identified, and law enforcement, alongside company officials, were never able to find out how he actually got inside the chimney in the first place. He didn't work there, and there were no signs of a break-in, yet there he was. This was an incident that wasn't answerable at the time, and was therefore consigned to history. But little did anyone know, this would not be the last time something bizarre took place at this facility. Blair Grandstrom was 20 years old when he vanished on the 3rd of June, 1995, which would be 8 years after the body was discovered. Blair was described as a bright young man and a brilliant student where he attended the Western Washington University in Bellingham. He was studying auto design technology and apparently was quite a popular student in high school which also transferred to college life, where he was able to forge new friendships. Universally, and by all accounts that I'd come across, he seemed to be a pleasant lad that was well liked by people. At this time in his life, in 1995, he was on his second year of attendance at the university, where he would come to vanish after leaving a party in the early hours of the third. After leaving this party, he went to a friend's house. He left this second house at 3am and then vanished sometime thereafter. According to this blog, which compiled information on Blair in 2010, he wasn't recognised as missing right away after attending the party, as his family believed that he was probably studying for his finals. I certainly can see the confusion here, as finals can be quite a nerve-wracking time, and some do turtle up a bit and spend all of their time studying alone. His roommates on the other hand, thought that he might have gone to visit his girlfriend, because obviously, he wasn't back at his dorm on Sunday, which was the day afterwards. They called the local jail and some hospitals to see if he might have had an accident, but he wasn't registered as being at any. Blair didn't show up to campus on the Monday, and this is probably when he should have been reported missing. But on Tuesday, he missed a final exam, and that's when the roommates and his family knew that something was wrong. Tuesday, unfortunately, was three days into the unrealized disappearance up until this point, and his family began putting up missing posters everywhere they could after arriving at the local police station. On the 7th, which was one day following this report to law enforcement, his body was found by an employee in the Georgia Pacific West Lagoon at 10am that morning. As briefly touched on earlier, this lagoon is used by the pulp mill facility for wastewater treatment and a routine maintenance was being carried out at the time. Weirdly, it's not even clear why one would attempt to enter this lagoon. Lieutenant Rick Soucy of Bellingham Police said that two fences with locked gates surrounded the plant and lagoon, and that there was no evidence of forced entry. Soucy speculated that Blair either climbed over the fences or entered through a breakwater area where there is no fence. The problem with this is that as far as I'm aware, the fences were all topped with barbed wire, making it unlikely that he'd climbed over, and the lagoon itself wasn't exactly inviting in any case. For the second time in nine years, law enforcement are puzzled by the passing of a man in an odd place at the waterfront pulp and paper mill. Roommates, along with family members, reported Blair missing the day before. The cause of his passing remains undetermined, said Dr. Gary Goldfogel. Whatcom County's medical examiner. Blair had no significant injuries or anything to indicate a struggle or foul play, and no pre-existing medical conditions that would account for his passing. 
Rick Susi said, I don't know why anybody would go into the lagoon. It's pretty ugly. You couldn't mistake it for a swimming hole. The smell would get you. The incident is equally baffling to mill officials. We're dumbfounded, said spokesman Ormon Darby. We have double fencing, an exterior and interior high fence. This is a rather repelling facility, not one that looks accommodating or casually interesting to get into. It's dark water, it's foam. It's obviously an industrial facility with pipes all around it. We don't have any knowledge how something like this could happen. Officials of the company, alongside law enforcement, also found no evidence of a break-in anywhere and stated that someone trying to get into the facility, or lagoon, was completely unheard of for them. Blair's roommates said that he'd never talked about going to this facility or wanting to go to the lagoon. Eric Titus was one of these roommates and when asked about what he thought happened, he said this. I have no clue. We're really surprised he turned up there. He didn't have any enemies. I don't know what happened. I don't know how we ended up where he did. It's interesting that Eric mentioned Blair not having enemies, suggesting, perhaps, that he wasn't of the opinion that this was an accident, and I suppose you can see why. The sentiment of not understanding what happened was basically echoed by the authorities who couldn't make heads or tails of how this happened, or actually, even what happened. It is known that Blair came to pass away in the water, but how and why is a puzzle no one has been able to solve. An autopsy failed to determine how Blair passed away. This is particularly interesting because Blair had not drowned. He didn't have water in his lungs. That actually reminds me of Jelani Brinson, who was also found in a body of water and similarly had no water in his lungs either. If you want to learn more about Jelani, I'll put a link of my coverage in the top right of the screen now and in the description if you want to open a new tab. We later find out that after Goldfogel organised the toxicology report, it was found that Blair was over the legal driving limit, which I believe was expected given that he'd been partying the night he vanished. Goldfogel knew full well that there was something just off about this entire incident though. He said something I found quite interesting. I'm still keeping the case open. I still don't think we know everything there is to know. It's possible he went there all by himself and got into the water by himself and passed away, but I don't think so. The body has to tell a story when it can't speak and the story it's telling us sounds like a lie. In essence, Goldfogel was stating that he did not believe that this was just some kind of unfortunate accident. Clearly, his beliefs were solidly in the camp of foul play and you can see why. We know that Blair did love the water, he enjoyed swimming, though this typically didn't extend to dark foamy wastewater. Could he have been lured out there then? It's possible of course, but the manner in which this went down isn't known at all. There was no evidence to suggest that happened, and as said, he hadn't sustained any injuries indicative of a struggle or an altercation. So you can also ascertain that he probably wasn't physically forced there either. In October of 2010, Blair's father, Peter Grandstrom, reportedly stated this to the press. Peter Grandstrom said investigators told him his son, who was on his second year at West Washington University, was drinking and likely wandered down to the water, where the toxic fumes caused him to pass away. There was no water in his lungs. Could that really have been what happened? Was he so out of his mind that he just dove right into that kind of water? If he did do that, Law enforcement and the owners of the facility could not figure out where he did this. There aren't any real conclusions to this incident, and you might think that this was the end of it, but no, this incident would repeat almost verbatim 15 years later. Dwight Clark was 18 years old and a freshman at the same university as Blair in Bellingham when he vanished on Sunday the 26th of September 2010. Dwight's profile was also somewhat reminiscent of Blair. He was described as a pleasant young man, intelligent and quite popular in the high school that he'd come from. A number of these friends had also gone to this university and as far as I can tell, he was fitting right in. Dwight was new to the city and had only moved to Bellingham about a week before he disappeared. So I'm assuming he wasn't yet all that familiar with the place. But at the university itself, 
he was liked and was able to get along with people. On the night Dwight vanished, like Blair, he'd left the party. This one we know took place on Grant Street, but Dwight wasn't alone and was with a friend of his named Jonathan. Similarly, as you might imagine, they were drinking that night, but upon leaving, his friends would later note that Dwight actually hadn't had too much to drink while he was there. From the party, they walked together to what is now known as Billy Frank Jr. Street, which is where Jonathan lived. I'm not sure if they continued drinking at Jonathan's, but it seems that they did have some weed, and in the early hours of the morning, approximately 2am, he left to walk to his dorm alone. He never made it back to his dorm that night, and this was the last time he was ever seen. Something took place during this walk that would cause Dwight to vanish so thoroughly as to never be seen again. While there was no indication of what happened to him during this walk, there was this. Friends of Clark, who graduated with honours from Auburn High School, said Thursday that the focus on downtown is because a blank text message was sent from his cell phone at about 2.40am which is 40 minutes after police believe he left the party. Police traced the text message and determined it was sent from the downtown area, the friend said. Dwight was quite social and a bit of a prolific texter on his phone and sent around 6,000 messages per month according to his mother, Raylan. This was to his friends and family, so people were quite quick to realise that something was wrong when these messages just ceased. He also failed to attend his lectures on the Monday morning and he was reported missing on the evening of the 27th, the day afterwards. His mother would be the one to make the call to the authorities as she became increasingly concerned that Dwight wasn't replying to her and I believe he also missed his finals. On the morning of the 28th, investigators brought search dogs to Billy Frank Jr. Street and they attempted to follow Dwight's scent. The dogs indicated that after leaving the house, Dwight looked to have walked in a northerly direction. The dogs followed this scent as far as they could before they lost it. It's not really clear why they lost the scent after following it. That could indicate that something happened right there at the point it ended. This is interesting in and of itself, because if he'd had too much to drink or just passed out somewhere, the dogs should have led searchers straight to him. This never happened, but whatever the case may be, authorities now had a point to focus on and searchers flooded the area looking for him. Law enforcement stated that with the help of many volunteers, they were actively trying to retrace Dwight's steps. There wasn't anything obvious that might indicate a struggle had taken place anywhere around the point at which the dogs lost the scent. The press were talking to his friends and they relayed the fact that just outright disappearing was completely out of character for Dwight. They said that he was a bit shy at first, but quickly opened up and was the type of guy that you'd just immediately become friends with because he was funny and very friendly. They were making the point that Dwight wasn't the type to have enemies and that it was completely bizarre that he hadn't been found. As the search fired dogs and boots on the ground was ongoing, investigators entered Dwight's dorm room and searched it looking for any kind of evidence that might explain his absence but there was nothing there that gave any kind of an indication that he was going to leave or anything to that effect. To compound that fact, police went on to say that his disappearance was leaning towards the unusual side because his car remained at the location Dwight parked it on campus and his bank account hadn't seen any activity since he vanished. This pretty much ruled out the idea that for some reason Dwight had just up and absconded in his car Dwight was also enjoying his time at the university it seems, so this doesn't seem to have been a purposeful act. Raylan had been discussing plans with him about going on a camping trip, but Dwight didn't want to go because he didn't want to miss any of his classes. He also had a girlfriend at the time called Danielle, who based off the articles, he seemed to like very much. Dwight's medical history was questioned, but Raylan travelled all the way to Bellingham to help search and relayed that he didn't have any medical issues. I get the impression that while everyone was hoping for the best, she, alongside everyone really, knew that something was very wrong and likely suspected foul play. Virtually everyone that came into contact with Dwight on the day that he vanished was questioned, but no leads came of this. In fact, it was found that he was happy on the day he vanished. He hadn't been part of any altercations or anything like that. To be clear also, and again, people present at the party stated that he didn't have too much to drink and he was coherent. 
Based off all the factors present, Police Chief Randy Stagmier said that the department was perplexed by this case and that they were hoping for a break somewhere. But that break just never seemed to come. After the search dogs lost his scent somewhere downtown, that was his last known location. Days after he disappeared, on the 1st of October, search dogs were said to have been interested in the Georgia Pacific West facility. Law enforcement did focus on this area for a while, both on land and in the water, but after these searches failed, they thought they needed to move on. This seems to be quite the distance away, and I'm not really sure why, but this article suggested that the searchers focused on Lake Padden. It seems that Dwight's family wanted further searches made of the area that the dogs were early interested in near the facility. So with that, Dwight's family privately hired a search dog team whose dogs picked up a strong lead. Meaning, two separate dog teams now had seemingly caught Dwight's scent near the facility. So for some reason, that wasn't really clear to anyone, it seemed as though Dwight must have been there. Attempts had been made all throughout the search at pinging the phone, but investigators said that they weren't able to determine if the phone had been turned off, if the batteries ran out, or if it had broken. Which in hindsight could have indicated that it might have been in the water, and given that they had a scent there, might have been a good idea to stick around for longer. As the days dragged on, Schneider said a frustrating realisation developed. As we've put out all this information, all this coverage, all this volunteer effort, you realise this isn't garnering a lot of results. We're not developing a meaningful explanation. The lack of developments isn't just frustrating, it's adding to the case's mystery. This is really outside the norm. Schneider's comments were proven to be correct in the end. 11 days after Dwight vanished, his body was found in the water at Georgia Pacific West Lagoon. This must have brought back some memories and deja vu for the medical examiner, Dr. Gary Goldfogel, as he was once again tasked with trying to explain what happened to Dwight. The moment that he'd heard all of the details surrounding Dwight's disappearance, one can't help but wonder what might have been going through his mind. Dwight likely was in the Bellingham Bay during the 10 days in which he was missing and passed away in the water, according to the preliminary findings released by the medical examiner. Dr. Gary Goldfogel performed an autopsy and found no signs of inflicted trauma or internal injuries in Dwight's body. Goldfogel has not ruled out the cause and manner of Dwight's passing and will need to complete further studies. That is highly unusual. Goldfogel had now examined two bodies who'd seemingly had a very similar experience. He was not able to determine a cause for either Blair or Dwight. To be clear, unlike Blair, Dwight had drowned, but Goldfogel nor the authorities could figure out the manner in which this came to be. This passage highlights the problem quite well. The findings likely rule out the possibility that a crime occurred, spokesman Mark Young said. Albert and others were left to wonder now, not where their friend was, but why and how he came to pass away. I just want to know what happened to him, said a friend. Detectives will continue looking into how and under what circumstances Dwight got into the water. The quote earlier by Goldfogel in relation to Blair was quite interesting. The body has to tell a story when it can't speak, and the story it's telling us sounds like a lie. I wonder if he now felt that he had two lies on his hands. Could the blank text he sent at 2.40 in the morning be a sign of a sudden panic? Could there have been another presence nearby that made him feel uneasy, but he didn't get the chance to send the message he actually wanted to send? This is an idea that I've seen crop up in a few comments on Dwight, but upon discovery of his body, he still had his wallet with money and cards contained within, so he hadn't been robbed. His phone was also still on his body. For a person that didn't seem to have any enemies, it's difficult to come up with a motive for foul play especially since he hadn't sustained any injuries. No form of an explanation ever really came in explaining why Dwight was down there and why, and how even, he actually entered the water. A year after this incident took place, this was reported and it's quite apt. What compelled him to go down to the water that night remains as much a mystery today as it was then, said Randy Stagmere. At this point, I've practically exhausted all of the information I could find about Dwight, 
so it's probably a good time to hand it over to you in the comments below. What are your thoughts here? I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching and a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around on the screen. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like, hit the bell and subscribe if you haven't already. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike. I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day or evening depending on where you are and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys. Peace.